Hello everyone and welcome to another video. Recently I busted some myths in Rollercoaster Tycoon 1 and 2 and discovered that a few of them got started in the manual of one of the games. I was a bit shocked to find out that there was blatant misinformation in the manuals that teach you how to play the game, so I decided to see how much more nonsense they contain. And it's a lot. I will mainly be analyzing Rollercoaster Tycoon 2's manual, but the one from RCT1 has a lot of lies around shops and stalls that the second one doesn't have, so let's start with that. The first mistake is in this design tips box in the fifth tip. It says that guests can drop food on the path, but that's not true. Now, this is not so bad as they do drop empty food containers, but it is still wrong. On the other side, it warns you to be careful with water rides that have spinning boats, as they can make guests feel very nauseous. This makes sense, except that the River Rapids, the only ride with spinning boats, has a very low nausea rating of usually not much higher than just one. In the same tip, it also says that guests will throw up in bathrooms, which is not true, although benches do help to lower nausea. On the next page, we find many lies about food and drink stalls. Firstly, it says that different guests have different tastes, but that's a lie. When guests want food, they just locate the nearest food stall and head for it, no matter what it is. A little bit later, we find a possible origin of the common myth that some foods are saltier than others. Once again, this is not true. The only difference is in their consumption time, and since popcorn has a very short consumption time, it actually increases thirst incredibly little. Lastly, it claims that guests that come off intense rides are rarely hungry. Hunger plays no role at all in determining whether a guest goes on a ride, and going on a ride doesn't affect their hunger either. Hunger does affect how much nausea a guest gets, which the manual actually states correctly below. That was everything from Rollercoaster Tycoon 1's manual, so let's move on to the one from RCT2. After all the stuff on how to install the game, it immediately goes wrong in the second paragraph. When talking about ways that the park can fail, it mentions a bunch of valid reasons, but also flowers dying. Flower beds will slowly wither away over time if they're not watered by handymen or rain, but that has zero effect on anything. Skipping some technical stuff, which is all fine, we arrive on page 19, specifically the section about water tools. It claims that guests will cool down on water rides, but alas, the weather and water rides have zero effect on each other. I get why they put this in, as it makes the manual more fun to read and encourages people to build water rides, but it's still incorrect. Shortly after, there is a very minor mistake about the park rating. It says that it can range from 0 to 1000, but in truth, it's actually 0 to 999. This page also contains the first tip, and unlike several other ones, this one is actually true. I thought that overcharging for umbrellas when it rains was a player invention, but it's actually encouraged by RCT2's manual. It doesn't quite say 20 bucks, but it does indicate that you can charge a lot. A few pages further along, there is an error in the section that describes the clear scenery tool. In the very first sentence, it says that you can use this tool to remove scenery items larger than a single square, when it's in fact the opposite. Anything larger than a single tile cannot be removed with it. A few sentences later, it does correctly say that though. The tip on this page is also wrong. It says that you're always charged for changing the landscape, but there are scenarios where money doesn't exist. If you ignore those scenarios, the tip is technically true, but a bit weird, as there is nothing to indicate that you sometimes wouldn't be charged for it. Later, in the landscaping section, there is this tip about being able to use the special mountain tool when you're in the scenario editor. This is correct, but I've always found it weird that it is only available in the scenario editor, and not during actual gameplay, as it makes it so much easier to make hills. On the right side, the scenery section starts, and it immediately makes some false claims. According to the manual, making appealing environments adds significantly to the enjoyment that the guests derive from your park, and increases the excitement and intensity ratings of your rides. 
there are two things wrong with this. Firstly, the word appealing is complete nonsense here. It doesn't matter what the scenery looks like at all. You can build the most horrific, ugly, offensive or boring park ever and the guests will love it all the same as long as enough scenery items are present. And secondly, scenery doesn't change the intensity rating of a ride. Well, it actually can do that, but only if you build them in very specific positions and even then only after you retest the ride. And the most people don't retest the ride after they build scenery. When describing trees a bit further down, the manual claims that trees provide shade, but no shade mechanic exists in Rollercoaster 1 or 2, or any theme park game as far as I'm aware. Below that it says that some scenery items only take up half or a quarter tile. Quarter tile scenery objects do exist, but half tile ones do not. Paragraph E of the scenery section talks about footpath accessories and it lies about lamps being a necessity and increasing the comfort of your guests. Sure, they can look nice, but they don't do anything and don't even count as scenery for scenery bonus purposes. Right below that, signs receive the same treatment. You're told that they entertain and alert guests, but they do nothing. The only exception here is of course when they're set to no entry, that does work, but that doesn't entertain anyone. I don't want to just criticize the manual, so let's highlight something that I think is really good. Here it gives a tip about using scenery items to increase the excitement rating of a ride and it specifically talks about using head chopper elements to create the illusion of an impeding collision. This is actually a thing and scenery, path and other ride tracks all provide an additional bonus if they're placed very close above the track. You do have to retest the ride to get that bonus from scenery items though. The next chapter is about footpaths which is definitely not free from errors either, particularly this section which somehow contains three falsehoods. The first is that you should not use queue lines as normal paths as that will confuse the guests. Queue lines behave like any other normal path if they're not attached to a right entrance building and guests don't see the difference. You can't connect other queue lines to it though and it cannot do junctions so I still don't recommend using it too much but it definitely doesn't confuse anyone. The next sentence is also wrong as guests can ride a ride without a queue line just fine. For most rides this will be very inefficient so it's not a great idea but for some like the maze it works just fine. The third sentence once again is a lie as having a longer queue line for a more popular ride isn't always a good idea. Guests that are in a queue line aren't riding other rides so having a long queue line in a park where guests pay for the rides will cost you a lot of money. Long queue lines can also make guests unhappy which is another downside. The fourth and final sentence of this paragraph is finally true but it's quite shocking how wrong this bit is. The rest of the path section is more technical stuff on how to actually build paths so let's move on to the ride construction. Here we immediately see a tip that says that guests can see other rides from being high up and maybe get an interest in riding them. This is completely false and being on a ride has zero effect on interest in or knowledge about other rides. Guests can more easily find a ride that is both very tall and very exciting but that's the other way around. Next to this we can read the sentence, remember variety is key in building rides, after all why would you visit a park that has 15 merry-go-rounds? and nothing else. If you've been watching my videos for a while, you know that guests will gladly visit that park. There are extremely few negative effects from spamming the same ride over and over again. The only downside is that if you have two or more of the same ride type, the park value they contribute and how much you can charge for them goes down by 25%. So in a pay for entry park without a park value call, there are no negatives at all. Guests will happily visit a park with 100 merry-go-rounds and nothing else. Here it also starts the myth that guests actually use transport rides to get to certain places. They don't. Transport rides are treated like any other ride and guests have no idea where they will exit if they go on one. It's also wrong about gentle rides as it says that they are for all guests but there are plenty of guests that will only go on intense rides and never on gentle ones. 
The thrill ride section contains a very odd error as it lists the bumper cars as a thrill ride when in reality it's a gentle ride. Speaking of rides, the manual has several items where they cover a real life coaster and say which coaster type it is in RCT2. A few pages ago it had one about the multi-dimension coaster, except they call it the multi-dimension null coaster. It's an easy mistake to make and I've made it myself many times as well, but it's wrong nonetheless. And the mistakes keep on coming. The next section is how to care for your ride and it explains all the tabs on your ride window. Most of this is fine, but under the music section it says that it attracts guests, which is a lie. The only positive effect music has is that guests can think that the music is nice, which increases their happiness. But they can only think that if they're not already thinking that the jumping fountains or scenery is nice, and even then only if the music is organ style or the merry-go-rounds fairground organ organ style. Immediately below that is the paragraph about ride statistics and I don't even know how they messed this up so badly. First it says that the intensity is calculated using only the g-forces of the ride, while in reality it uses many other factors such as the top speed and the number of inversions. This is not so bad yet, but if we look further down the list of stats that are in the statistics window, it completely forgets that lateral g-forces and drops exist. The stats for highest lateral g -forces Force, number of drops and highest drop height are nowhere to be found. This is just bizarre. Next up is the chapter about running the park and we immediately run into an error very early on in the staff section. It says that if something goes wrong you could injure or even kill your guests. This is false as there exists no such thing as injuries in the roller coaster tycoon universe. Guests either survive great falls without any injuries at all or immediately die from running an inflatable dinghy into the ground at 2 km an hour. The next few pages is all very dry explanation of different functions that can help you manage the park and there's not much wrong with it. It's not until the finances section that we find the next big error. According to the manual, the calculation for your park value takes into account the value of the land and equipment owned, the quality and profitability of the ride in your park and your public reputation aka park rating. This is just completely wrong. In reality, the bulk of your park value comes from the excitement, intensity and nausea ratings of your rides multiplied by their age value. The other, often much smaller bit comes from the number of guests that have ridden your rides in the last 5 minutes and the number of guests in your park. How much land you own, the profitability of anything and the park rating have nothing to do with it. The tip about marketing that's next to it is also slightly incorrect. It says that guests will be disappointed if they are spawned from a marketing campaign for half price park entry while your park is free to enter. It's kind of the other way around. If your park fee is less than 6 bucks, this ad is 87.5% less effective in spawning guests, but the guests that do spawn don't mind the very cheap or free entry. The last thing that I want to talk about is this showcase of how to build a ride. The design is a bit ugly, but it's decent enough and it will teach you how to build a basic coaster. My problem is with the incredibly short two-tile station. This is a very odd choice and it even says that a longer station is probably better. If they do realize it, then why not use one? This is the example that you're providing and throughput is vital for making money with your ride, so I find this choice very odd. As you can see, the manual is somehow full of mistakes. From giving wrong advice to just straight up stating incorrect facts, it's baffling how many lies it contains. To learn more about wrong things that aren't in the manual, click here to learn about some common misconceptions. Thank you for watching and I will see you in the next video.